Texas, USA, where the men are men, women are women, and the spice they make a song and dance about is the world's hottest, chili. To a Texan, chili means chili con carne, a dish of fiery chili peppers with meat. They're red, green, smooth, or wrinkled. Here at Talingua, the chili has become an international cult in the dish that's known as a bowl of red. Each November, 10,000 or so chili fanciers gather near Dirty Woman Creek for the giant chili cook-off. This is a cookery competition. The atmosphere may be slightly different from a gathering of French chefs, but at heart, it's a serious occasion. You burn some whiskey and when the coals get hot, you cock up the meat and you throw it in a pot. With some chili pots and garlic and camino oyster, and you add a little salt until they're just enough. A reminder that the Texan art of chili cooking does have touches of refinement. Did somebody ask, where are the beans? But if you know beans about chili. You know that chili has no beans. Don't think the prize goes to the hottest bowl of red, but the subtlest blend of minced beef, chilies, tomatoes, garlic, and onions. Chili was God's gift to Texas. Or maybe it came down below. That chili doesn't go with macaroni. And damn Yankees don't go with chili queen. And if you know beans about chili, you know that chili has no beans. But chili presents a macho image. A real man holds his liquor and eats his chili red hot. The Texans boast chili con carne didn't come from Mexico, but Mexico is the homeland of the chili pepper. The people called it Chile, a word passed onto the world by the Spanish who came as conquerors. All the capsicums, from the hot chili to the sweet pepper, grew here unknown to the rest of the world. The Spanish stumbled on a whole new menu. Turkey, the tomato, the potato, sweet corn, and the chili, growing on bushes like rose bushes, which make a fruit as long as cinnamon, full of small grains as biting as pepper. Chili mattered to the Indian cooks. They were addicted to the taste of the fruit. Sweet, hot, green, yellow and red, dried, pickled or crushed fresh with water to make a simple sauce. Chili seasoned food as long ago as 9,000 years. Seeds have been found on the floors of caves where dwelt Mexican Indians. They wouldn't eat without it. Chili was the flavoring. Today, the worldwide use of the chili is as much a memorial to the early peoples of Mexico as the strange temples they left behind. Ceremonial food offered here to the gods contained chilies. Strict Aztec parents punished children by making them breathe fumes of the burning peppers. Mothers used them to control the sexual urges of their daughters. If a girl looked at a man, chili was rubbed into her eyes. If she slept with him, yes, well, Today, Mexican markets are still devoted to chilies. In a place like this, you wouldn't get very far with the phrase, por favor, a pound of chilies, please. Chilies, senora, we have the ancho, the pasilla, the mulatto, the serrano, the habanero, jalapeno, chiltepin, paella, chile de agua, chile de agua. There are more than a hundred different kinds of chilies. The fresh chili, picked before it's ripe, appears in the summer growing season. 
but the dried red and black varieties are sold round the year. These fruits, ripened on the plant, have been dried in the sun. Shriveled, their heat has intensified. Some taste warm and rich, others fiery hot. They are the very essence of Mexican cooking. Europe in the 15th century. To Europeans, the world was still undiscovered. Beyond the known horizons, anything could exist. With only rumors and guesses to guide them, men were prepared to coop themselves up in small ships, cut off from the familiar world for months, even years. They were driven, of all things, by the desire to control the supply of spices. The search for pepper and its homeland, India, took Christopher Columbus on a terrifying journey. With him, he took a sample of black pepper, one of the most pungent spices then known. What he actually found was the Americas and something called chilies. Columbus brought a spice he wrongly called pepper from people he wrongly called Indians to the whole world. He took the chili back across the Atlantic to Spain. The Portuguese were to take the spice on eastwards. Africa was the starting point. Unlike Columbus, the Portuguese decided to round the continent to reach the prize, India. As a result, today, the world's hottest chilies grow here. But they sailed onwards past the Cape to Mozambique and Mombasa. A knowing pilot and a favorable blast of monsoon blew them to India. Ships brought the chili to a land where cooks claim it as their own. Only 20 years had passed since its discovery in America. As the Portuguese battled for the country that would give the black pepper, they were already selling this new spice to the Indians. Today it is hard to imagine that once Indian food was without it. Huge quantities were planted and enthusiastically consumed. The chili was the missing ingredient that brought real fire to curry. Here, alongside chilies, are roasted cinnamon, cloves, coriander, black pepper, and cumin seeds. The spices are the flavoring for pork vindaloo. The meat is added to the rich sauce of spices, crushed onions, fresh ginger, garlic, and vinegar. Pork vindaloo is the speciality of the old Portuguese province of Goa. It is one of the lasting benefits from the meeting of Europeans and Indians. Dip in boiling water, and the curry just cooks itself. Hundreds of similar dishes have been designed to make even poor meat tasty. For millions of people, the chili, not the discovery of new worlds, was the true benefit of Columbus's voyages. From India, chili moved on yet again. The same Portuguese traders sailed to Japan with their new spice. In less than half a century, chili had spread across the globe. For many years, the Portuguese were the only foreigners privileged to enter Japan. They carried gold and silk from China, but they were only allowed to trade from an island off the port of Nagasaki. The Portuguese may not have entered Japan proper, but their spice certainly did. Today, the Japanese grow their own and even export them. Here are some of the world's hottest, hawk's claw. Wherever the chili came to rest, in different soils and different climates, it took on a slightly new character. Now the world has thousands of different sizes and colors. The Japanese also grow gentler strains. They are so prized that Japan sends a good proportion of its crop to America. The Japanese have completed Chile's circle of the globe.
cooking here emphasizes appearance as much as flavor. Chili has both. This is a large radish common in Japan, the daikon. Make holes in it, stuff in dried red chilies. Grate the root, and you have a condiment whose Japanese name means grated autumn leaves. The Japanese favor chilies in sauces. Serve this one with a soup of squid, Chinese mushrooms, and bean curd, a hot complement to a delicate broth. City. This bar's sophisticated patrons are hardly aware that they sip a spice once known only to the Indians of old. In the 1920s, two of Columbus's discoveries, the tomato and the chili, were combined with vodka to produce a drink which itself has traveled the world, the Bloody Mary. Louisiana, near the lakes that surround the mouth of the Mississippi River. Right here are found all the ingredients of the red-hot Louisiana chili sauce that flavors the Bloody Mary. Chilies, dried and pounded, make chili pepper. Mixed, the hotter cayenne. Grind the sweet varieties and you have mild paprika. But these chilies, bird peppers, are for the hot sauce. They confirm the general rule that small upward growing peppers are the fiercest. Chilies are picked only when bright red. This is the start of a long process. Years will pass before the chilies end up in those little round bottles that let out a drop at a time. I'm gonna take them off, do what you want. Just after the American Civil War, this man's great-grandfather started the business. The source from here is now sent all over the world. Three. Every summer day, ripe peppers are brought straight from the fields to the factory. Locally mined salt is thrown on these thin-skinned peppers. They are beaten and chopped to a pulp. The salt stops the peppers going bad and encourages them to ferment. The mixture is ready for a long hibernation. All that it takes to finish the sauce is a strong sieve to remove the seeds and the addition of some spirit vinegar. But first, there's a three-year wait. Sichuan, China. Over a hundred million people live here. The Yangtze River. It flows through the province on its way to the sea a thousand miles away. The river was an enemy until an engineer, revered as the man who tamed the dragon, stopped it flooding. In the 2,000 years since, its waters have sustained life in Sichuan. The people have created a unique cuisine, with hot tastes to complement the region's abundant rice and bean curd. The cooks use a lot of local strongly flavored spices, garlic, fresh ginger, Sichuan pepper, and most of all, chili. They say the heat of the chili makes you sweat, which cools you down. It also helps repel this province's steamy damp. Throughout history, spicy sauces have vitalized bland carbohydrates like this white rice. This chef is about to conjure one of the most coveted of all Sichuan dishes. 
At the bottom is a layer that's dry and partly stuck to the pan. Here is Koba. This fragile shell is taken away to be broken into pieces and deep fried until crisp. A sauce using pieces of sliced fresh chili for fire and crunchiness is poured over the hot rice. In the kitchen, the master chef prepares a Sichuan pork. Thinly sliced pieces are dipped in corn flour and water. Then, in a method peculiar to this province, they are immersed in a little boiling stock. By fierce cooking, the chef aims to reduce the liquid. The meat becomes almost dry and crusty. The old and experienced teach this art to the young. Not through recipes, but by example. Fresh chili has no place in this dish. Now it's the turn of the dried chili and its sauces. A touch of this dry mixture of ground chili and black bean, or a spoon of paste of ground chili and chili oil, as well as a hint of the other valued spice, Sichuan pepper. When the stock has almost boiled away, it's time for the flavorings. A little chili oil is sizzled with the meat. A spoon of dry chili mixture goes onto a plate of shredded fried vegetables and the pork. Layers of flavor in a Sichuan dish, hot enough to blow your head off. 4,000 dishes are cooked here. 400 feature one form or another of chili. With so much fire around, what else could be the centerpiece? The people here refuse to agree that they had no chili before Columbus. Records from earlier times contain references to such a spice. The Sichuanese say the markets of today sell all kinds of chilies, just as they would have over a thousand years ago. Chili peppers could have been brought from America by a Chinese-type Columbus, or maybe they grew naturally in this remote province. Whatever, the first sensation in Sichuan food is the fire of chili. Then other flavors seep through, sweet, sour, salty, tangy. The chili stimulates the palate and bestows a kind of extra subtlety on the other tastes. <laughs> Chilies with breakfast at 6.30 in the morning. Only in Sichuan is chili oil poured neat onto breakfast noodles. The Wang family are agricultural workers. Three generations live here. They work on the commune alongside hundreds of other families producing soya bean and millet. But one crop they grow for themselves to eat and to earn extra money. It is the chili which thrives in tropical Sichuan. In season, its smell welcomes any approaching stranger. These plants will produce a special Chinese variety, Lak Chao. It's very long and thin and will find its way to free markets across China. These delicate flowers grow into the fruit. This spice really was Mexico's gift to the world. It is good to eat and it grows easily. So many of the world's cuisines are now dependent upon chilies. These Mexicans have another reason to be proud. Molly, an ancient Indian word, means a sauce with chilies. Its preparation is thought to be the oldest surviving recipe. Puebla, a city taken from the Aztecs by the Spanish 500 years ago. The convent of Santa Rosa.
One legend says it was here that the old dish of mole was not only kept alive, but adapted to become the great Mexican dish of today, mole poblano. One of the good sisters provided the inspiration. Here in the kitchen, Sister Andrea of the Ascension gave thanks for the building of her convent by devising a special meal for the Viceroy and the Archbishop. She started with the food of ancient Mexico, chili and chocolate. Dried chilies, she said, were essential to every local dish. Bitter chocolate seemed fitting for a meal of celebration. It was, after all, customary to offer it only to emperors, the merchant nobility, and the upper ranks of the priesthood. Then Sister Andrea added the food brought by the Spanish invaders. Cinnamon, almonds, raisins, and cumin seeds. Sister Andrea said the ingredient must be ground with some bananas, onions, garlic, and tomatoes. Then her Indian servant took charge. A servant really knew about making molis. For generations, her family had prepared them. She spent three days at the Matate, massaging this unusual combination to the right consistency. She dropped her ball of dark chili paste into a pan with some fat. The paste slowly melted and dissolved into a sauce that needed no flour for thickening. She added just enough stock to make the mixture thin enough to pour, and for Sister Andrea, she had created a sauce unlike anything in the world. The mixture may seem bizarre, but it has just the right range of rich, bitter, and spicy notes. All that was needed was the chocolate and the pieces of cooked turkey. As the story goes, so well liked was this concoction of Sister Andrea's that soon it was being served in other convents and throughout Mexico. And there it is, the country's national dish, a dish of high days and holidays. It does seem fitting that this hot and spicy creation is the pinnacle of Mexican cooking. These are the people the world has to thank for the chili.